Iranian female rock climber competes without hijab but faces retaliation. Recently, Iranian female professional rock climber El Naz Rikabi publicly competed in an international rock climbing event in Seoul, South Korea without a hijab. The images of her climbing while her hair flowing in a pony while her hair was flowing in a ponytail went viral. Her act was viewed as a sign of solidarity with the women of Iran and in a rejection of clerical authority. Soon after she competed, she went missing, with her family unable to contact her. BBC's Persian service confirmed that the Islamic regime confiscated the athlete's phone and passport after she competed. There are other reports that she was lured into Iran's embassy in Seoul, where she was then taken directly to the airport. When she arrived back in Iran, she received a hero's welcome as hundreds of people cheered her name outside of the airport, despite it being in the early hours of the morning. She was then taken directly to a gauntlet of meeting, meetings with various sports officials, and she allegedly apologized to Hamid uh, Sajjadi, Iran's sports minister. Sajjadi told reporters Rikabi admitted to forgetting her hijab during the competition due to stress. He added, quote, she said that she is ashamed. Rikabi's appearance followed Sajjadi's uh, Sajadi's statements in front of the press, where the athlete repeated what Sajadi claimed, which was widely viewed as a forced confession. Rajat, no, excuse me, Rakabi made an Instagram post that said, I apologize about what I did to make you worry. So there's actually a lot more in this story to unpack. So if people don't know, well, I the hijab is mandatory in Iran, first of all, but this also includes for athletes who compete outside of Iran for the nation have to be in hijab no matter what sport they do. So she should have been in hijab as she was competing in this international climbing competition. And she ended up placing fourth overall. Um, and so these images of her climbing this wall without the hijab, like it, it shocked everyone because people know what the consequences of her taking this action will be. They're going to be very, very severe. And um, then all of a sudden, after she did this, she went missing. And a lot of people didn't know what to do or what had happened to her. Her family was not able to contact her. And there were a lot of different like rumors flying around about what happened. At first, I thought it was maybe possible that she evaded the authorities and was going to go seek asylum in South Korea. However, unfortunately, that's not what happened. She was ascertained by running. Oh, go ahead, Armin. No, not unfortunately. That was um, fortunately. I'll clarify later. You okay. Finish it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so basically she ended up being ascertained by Iranian authorities and taken to the Iranian embassy, allegedly under false pretenses. And there are reports that she signed a document that where she had to give a check to the authorities of the amount of like 35,000 us dollars and um some sort of contract that says that basically if she pisses off the authorities again or tries to leave the country then the authorities can confiscate the land belonging the land properties of her family so basically according to the reports that i have read they're using this against her as collateral and it's very common for iranian athletes that compete abroad to be forced to sign over checks you know, over $30,000, again, to be used against them as collateral to make sure that or try to make sure that they don't try to escape the grip of the Iranian authorities when they're abroad and seek asylum and so forth. Um, and well, Armin, what do you want to say? Okay, so the, the government of Iran makes Iranian women, obviously, wear the hijab, even as head of Iran, when they're representing the Iranian government in sports and stuff, right? So right in the middle of the protests, like the greatest um, woman-led uprising in the world, um, where the hijab, taking hijab is its main symbol, this lady decides to do her 
competition well without her job. So it was pretty obvious what she was doing. She was making an announcement, right? She was making, taking a stance. It was pretty obvious. As soon as it came out, it was recognized as such and celebrated at, or uh, attacked as such by both her supporters and religious people who were condemning her for it. So this whole idea of this being a mistake or some an accident is nobody believes this, right? That she it was it's obvious that she's forced to say that that she was not this was not intentional. Um, the thing is that the people the like I follow a lot of pro regime religious people. Um, they made fun of her for saying that this is a desperate act act of trying to get asylum and not come back to Iran, right? But she basically became a hero when the people realized that she had no intention of not coming back. Like she was going to come back. So this is why was, this was heroic. Because if she was like, oh, I'm going to take off my hijab, I can't go back, so I take an asylum. Because, okay, so this is for out of self-interest, right? But, but that's not probably... even necessarily true. I know. I'm just telling you what the narrative okay. is. Yeah. <clears throat> but but she became even a bigger hero when people realized that she had no intention. She was going to come back and she's going to continue competing in her field for um, as a rock climber and everything. Um, but like the way <clears throat> she was interviewed, this is like her interview. Like she's obviously she looks very much in distress. She looks like she did it. She didn't. She, she looks like she doesn't mean what she's saying. Uh, she was like doing. Here, like, I don't know how to explain this to you, but it seemed like she was just repeating uh, words that she was given to say. But I think that understanding is that she said these. She was like, "Oh, I just forgot. I, like it was just an accident." But the narrative the about why this happened is so bad. The there are like, there's multiple things. They're like, oh, there was a mishap. She lost her luggage and she couldn't find her hijab. Oh no. And then the other one is like, I, I was so stressed out about finding my rock climbing shoes. I forgot my hijab. Like it doesn't make any no, sense. Yeah, but, but you can see the entire time she's like sitting there, she's taking her socks off, changing her shoes, sitting like calmly. Like, this is not something, like, you have been competing forever. You know that you're supposed to wear the hijab. You know that this is a career, could be a career-ending or family-threatening thing. It's not something you would forget, right? So the excuse is so... And that video that I just showed you is when she came back to Iran in the airport, when the reporters were questioning her, that her excuse is so unbelievable that people know that she's, like, basically telling everybody indirectly that I'm just telling everybody what I'm supposed to say. Because... They come after you so aggressively and they come after your family. They come after your family's belongings and everything. So everybody understands that you have to say what you're supposed to say, right? But at the same time, she was welcomed, a hero's welcome in, at 4 a.m. at the airport, right? So, so many incredible. people. Show. Yeah. So just because, like, guys, like this, an act of uh, taking off the hijab right results in is, is such a is seen as a symbolic heroic act of standing with your country that this is what you get at 4 a.m when you're landing by the way when she landed the government didn't let her come out like they got her and they put her in a car and they took her to government officials to and just basically make made sure her travel out. earlier than she was expected to to try to avoid something like this Yes, yes, and yeah, but but even though so many people showed up at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. She's, in, she's in that car. At these girls with that hijab this is in iran oh my god so 
this is they all came here to treat her like a hero because she took off she climbed uh, did the rock climbing without a hijab i just want people to realize like what how this is viewed in iran by like because of the welcome party but i don't know so another thing another thing to recognize is that the religious people that were making fun of her they, because she was trying to get asylum they are like crushed right now they're coming up with such ridiculous angles like they look they look really bad they look really bad the pictures that she has with like government officials acting like she's now a good girl and we we talked Wait, over... go to the show notes i have a photo of that that i want to show it's the first one the iran wire first sure. yes because there's something that's kind of subtle about this image it's actually really really important it's not the first one let me try the second and the third one <clears throat> maybe it's the oh, third it is one. the first one mm. can you share it like because look this is what i have oh what okay just a second sorry Oh, to show. Is it an Instagram post? No, I have it right here. Okay. Okay, let's bring this up. Okay. So here's pictures of when she had to go to the um, her like forced meetings with all the sports officials. There are different stories about like what, so her brother is the one wearing yellow right here. But what's important about this is she is still being defiant even in these photos, because look, she's still not wearing the hijab. She's no. just wearing a hoodie and a baseball hat to cover her This head. is illegal. What she's wearing this, is illegal. But this isn't the hijab. No. So even despite all this, all these pressures that they're putting against her and her family. So this man in yellow right here is her brother, who has also been ascertained by like special authorities and people can't reach him. Like it's very unclear about what's happened to him. Nevertheless, she's still not complying, which I think is just. I mean, I don't have words. Yeah, this is what she's wearing right now is still arrest worthy. Mm -hmm. But they're so desperate in making sure that she says the things that they wanted to say. But like it, the government is just so ridiculous because the the excuses they're coming up with is like it's like they don't even care if people believe them anymore, right? That like, is so they, true. They, they they kill protesters and like oh this one was bitten by a dog or like oh this one slipped from the rooftop, like oh this one just got a heart attack and they like. Do you even care if people believe you anymore? Like, oh, like this lady that like in an act of defiance took off her job for rock in, in her rock climbing competition. They're like, oh, it was an accident. It was an accident that she did the entire competition, the entire thing without a hijab, this whole thing. Like all of this was done without a hijab by accident. Like everybody, like even your own supporters know that you're like, like, how could people because the government officials they act like they have the moral high ground like they're islamic and they're above us but they lie knowing that even their own supporters know that they're lying so how could you even lie to yourself that you have the moral high ground here it's just yeah. like it just seems like it's a it's it's a machine now that just mm -hmm. doesn't even care about the outcome like mm -hmm. it's that there's an understanding that everybody knows that we're gonna lie but this is just how we operate. Like they're just like following the manual, regardless of what the outcome is. It's just like they don't even care what the outcome is. I don't understand. Like it's it's like it's it's a it's a circus. Like then it's a show. I don't. It doesn't make any sense. It's a weird. It's the most bizarre government I've ever seen. Maybe after North Korea. Nothing makes sense about what they do. You're not lying. Oh my God. Well, okay. So given the fact that they just like seemingly have stopped giving a crap about selling any convincing narrative, like how is this being received by the hardliners that you follow? Cause this is just, I mean, it must be pretty freaking embarrassing, right? Did, yeah. How, how, how do the people that support the hardliners still 
in what way do they couch their buy-in? How do they articulate that they're still buying in? I, w I was watching the hardliners like coverage in this. The they were making fun of her for lying. And I was like, what? Yeah, no, because like, she's like, oh, you forgot the hijab. Sure. Of course you wouldn't forget the hijab. I'm like, why? You know, she's being pressured to say this. This is like, a forced confession. You... This is normal this is a, in Iran. <laughs> this is a forced, co like, like, be like, oh, she's telling us that she forgot her job. How could she forget her job? Obviously she's lying. Like we, we should be telling it to you. Why are you telling us to us? <laughs> like, why are you making her fun of her for lying when she's obviously being forced to do so? Like, do you not know that she's in Iran and she is like under a pressure by the government to step back in line? Like, I don't understand. How is that? Like, and and I like, I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. Why are they making fun? I look at the comments and people are making. Like all the comments, all the pro regime people are still making fun of her for lying. I like you guys are have lost your minds. I like weird. my brain is broken. That literally makes no sense. Oh What's God. really unfortunate though is that she is now very clearly still under the direct control of the regime. I mean, she's within the country's borders. Yeah. There are many reports about the retaliation that she faces, like the collateral that's been taken out against her, like I talked about earlier. And there are some reports, including by Iran Wire, that said that basically once she lands and has gone through this gauntlet of forced meetings with officials, that she's going to be transferred directly to Avene Prison, the prison that was recently set on fire under very suspicious circumstances in Tehran, one the most notorious prison in Iran. And um, people don't know her whereabouts since. We don't know where she is right now. We don't know her whereabouts. I think the whereabouts of her brother are still in question as well. And um, her family can't contact her. And what's in particularly important is that she also had a meeting with Iran's Olympic Committee. But the photos, from that meeting haven't been released yet. So people are thinking that they took the photos at the event and they're going to try to publicize those photos at a later date to show her whereabouts or something um, when really she's God knows where detained somewhere. Um, but I think we should also give some other general updates on Iran. Armin, are you interested in that? Yeah, go ahead. It sounds good. Okay. So, oh my gosh, there's a lot that's been going on. This, the story of El Naz, the rock climber, is one of the biggest stories that's happened in this past week. Um, but it's also important to think about like the wider stories as well. So I've seen reports from one human rights agency that said that they estimate that something around 12 and a half thousand people have been detained over the past we're on day 34 now of the uprising. So the, over the past 34 days, over 12,000 people detained. Um, I saw another estimate that roughly 225 people have been killed. I think around 30 of them are children. And um, I think the other big story that we need to talk about today is the historic protest that just happened in Berlin. Um, so Armin, do you want to like describe for people what that is? Oh yeah, there was um, after the mass protest of Iranians in Toronto, which a record of 50,000 people showed up. Mm -hmm. uh, now we have, I think, what is, some estimates suggest is 100,000 Iranians um, protest against the regime in Berlin. Let me actually show you what that looks like. This, this is, is crazy. This is the anti-Iranian regime. Wait, your audio just cut out. Yeah, my audio? Yeah, now I do. Yeah, so this is an anti-Iranian regime protest by Iranians in Berlin. So 
around 100,000 Iranians showed up in Berlin uh, in a mass demonstration just yesterday. Um, this is huge. I've, I think this is the largest gathering of Iranians outside of Iran ever. Ever in so, history. Yeah. And you, oh, look at that, the flag there, the flag of the lion and the sun. Yeah. This is, so this is the actual Iranian flag uh, before the Islamic Republic took over. But yeah. It goes all around. Wait, you so don't have this... the video where it shows the whole thing panning around? Wait. Here we go a little bit. This is crazy. Oh, man. No, I need to find the other video where the entire way around this rotunda it's people the entire thing yeah it's, it goes all around yeah aga is also saying that there was a huge protest in sydney yesterday there was a huge protest in australia there was a huge protest in los angeles another huge protest in washington dc so like the diaspora is still coming out in full force which is amazing to see what do you have there? So this girl just got shot and killed. What like more 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 girls and more women and men are dying in during the protest. This was a 32 year old uh, woman who died. But the unique thing about this um, murder was that she was recording while she got shot. So you can see things from her angle right before she got shot. So here here's the video. Hold on. Okay, so right before she died, she's chanting which means don't be afraid, don't be afraid, we're all together. So those were her last words right before she got shot and killed. And that's it, she died. And, and th this was her. That was her. So her name was Ghazole uh, Chalabi. Ghazole Chalabi. Yeah. So there's a lot of this still happening. It's like more than a month now in Iran. Protests are not dying. Down. Oh, this is what you're talking about. Hold on. I have... I have what you were looking for. Ah, oh, yes. This is in Berlin just yesterday. This is incredible. Yeah, this is crazy. Oh, can yeah. I tell you? Can I tell you, because I'm listening to a lot of pro-regime content these days, just to say, because it's hard for me to imagine how they're spinning all of this. Mm -hmm. So do you want to know how they spin this? Like, because this is embarrassing. This is so many Iranians, because the government constantly wants to say that the anti-regime people are just a fringe group, right? So these <laughs> mass demonstrations are, like, yeah, really right. embarrassing. So I was, like, trying to figure out how they're going to spin this. Like, I'm not talking about reports from the government itself. I'm talking about like content creators, young people, YouTubers who are pro-regime. So they went and looked at the website for buses that brings you, like that you could buy a ticket to get on the buses to get here. And they found that that on the buses, they give free sandwiches, okay? And he was like, they're here for the sandwiches. <laughs> oh my God. They're like, that's how you get these large numbers. These people don't care about anything. These people are coming here because there's free sandwiches. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm like, you guys are like, 
so desperate for any explanation that dismisses any oh anti-regime narrative. Oh my god. It so, was so bad. That's insane because Atheist Republic leader of the Persian community, uh, Babak, he went to this protest oh, yeah. and he was organizing buses of people to go from Austria to Berlin and um, helping organize fundraising to like pay for people that couldn't afford their tickets and all this stuff. And you're telling me that because th this bus was like a 10 hour bus ride, who yeah. the hell wants to be on a 10 hour bus line across national borders for one sandwich? Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> that so That's ridiculous. insane. Yeah, yeah, wait. I can show. Um, so, oh, yeah, super chat one of the things that Atheist Republic is doing with the funding that is available to us by our super generous community is we're actually helping pay um, for Babak's uh, transportation to this protest because I thought it was really important to have our leadership there representing us, networking with other people. And there were actually a lot of other Atheist Republic members there as well. So next week I'll be able to come with you guys and show you all the photography that Babak did of the event. Um, but I wanted to show um, some really uh, quick little ones that he did because I thought this was so cool. Um, so here's, uh, I'm not going to play the music just in case it's copyrighted, but this is some like on the ground view of what it looks like um, at the protest. So there was like a woman this wearing a cape. This is before the gathering started. This is the initial. He was early. This is before, like when. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Started, this is like the in gathering preparation. started. Yeah. This is yeah. Yeah. So cool. That's um, a very controversial flag, but oh, like Jinjian <laughs> Yeah, um. I love it. It's so cute. But then um, there's this other quick video that he did that was so cool. Look at this. Yeah. Using that like special 360 camera, it looks incredible. And then to see all the signs like fanning out, it just—I mean, it's huge. It's so massive. It's crazy. Um, so I'm excited to show you guys like more footage that he took um, next week. And uh, this other magazine put out these other incredible photos of the event. Look at this. I mean, it's people wow. like literally as like far as the eye can see. It's absolutely insane. Oh, that's such cool art. Wow. Wait, I sent you a video of a guy crying at the uh, protest. Did you see that? I don't think you did send that to me, but I have seen that video. Oh, do you have it? Uh. If you give me a second, I could probably find it. Um, while I go look for that video, can you please uh, pull up the video that I put in the private chat? Yeah. Because it's it from the that? protest in LA that I want to show. Oh, um, I found it. Wait, no, I already found it. Hold on. Oh, okay. So I don't know if the people remember the song I showed them. Um, I explained this with Harry Soto and the song from Sherwin, um, but they're playing that song that has now become the theme of the protest, which is a song about why people are protesting. And it was just, you know, this man here was very emotional while it was playing. This is in Berlin, you know, uh, in that circle that people were protesting from the 100,000 people showed up. This is one of the people during that. Protest. Well, and what is significant yeah. also is that he's wearing the traditional outfit of one of the ethnic minorities in Iran. I think oh, Bakhtiari. I didn't notice that. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, you're right. He's oh, wearing actually, like a Bakhtiari I... cloak. Yes. Oh, and then I have another video I want to show as well. Hold on. Let, okay, let me okay, just okay. play this and then I will show that. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, I want to show you another video. This one, I don't know if you've seen this. Have you seen this one? Oh, yeah, this is heartbreaking. Right, so this guy... Let me tell you. So this guy was being interviewed in the middle of the Berlin protest, and they were asking him why he was here for, and he showed the picture of the family, his family, that are missing because they they were arrested, and he doesn't know where they are. I think it was his... Um, oh yeah, in the Kurdish region in Sanandaj. Yes, which is He's under like, about... severe internet restriction, so like worse than other regions. Yeah. So it's really hard to figure out what's been happening in Sanandaj. Yeah, but what he didn't know is while he has a picture of his father and he's saying my father was arrested and there's no news of where he is. While he's talking, the news of his father's death is announced on the news while he's being telling people that I'm protesting because of my father. But here, let me actually translate what he's saying. Wait, can you translate? Hey, like, I'm so, I, I just, I'm so um, sorry that we have such a oppressive regime and he's holding a picture of his dad because he's fat. Yeah. That they come and just arrest your family like that, without any without any reason, without any uh, giving you any reason for the arrest. That curse be upon the Islamic Republic. Like I want all uh, freedom-loving people, all the um, human rights um, institutions in the world. I want them as, uh, Europa, as, uh, from the EU. Like I request to you to please pay attention to the arrested prisoners in Iran. Okay, so yeah, this is like his family He's saying my family have been stolen. So yeah, so he he didn't know that like while he was talking about his father and him wanting to know where he is, um, his father was. Oh no! One, yeah, he didn't know one hour before his father was, had died under torture, in prison. Well, you know, one hour before this interview, and he didn't know about it. So you wanted to show something? Yeah, in the private chat, can you pull up the video that I put in? It's from um, Sam Rajabi in, uh, no, no, I put, did I put the oh. wrong link? No, I didn't, different link. That's you, that's what you're sharing. Okay, no, you I asked you to share it, please. Oh, okay. okay, 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 there we go. There we go. And um, so this is Sam Rajabi. For those who don't know, he is a very prominent anti-regime activist who's now living in the United States. And he was a former Iranian athlete who had to leave Iran and live in exile because of his protest against the regime and so forth. And um, basically give up his career, you know, and everything for the sake of his freedom. And now he is a major organizer within particularly the Los Angeles Persian community. And um, this is him speaking or about the protest that happened in Los Angeles yesterday and how huge it is. So, um, Armin, do you think you could uh, play the video and then translate what he says? Yeah, oh, okay. And he's also a friend of Atheist Republic. Yes, yes. <laughs> Like these Iranians are standing shoulder to shoulder to Iranians inside Iran. These Iranians outside of Iran are united with Iranians inside Iran. Because, uh, let me clarify, because the Iranian regime was always trying to divide. Remember, there's always this strategy of dividing Iranians, uh, you know, ethnicities against each other, men against women, religious against secular. Um, upper class against lower class. It's a 
you, the, the Iranian regime has a divide and conquer strategy by making people hate each other. One of those division lines has been inside Iranians inside of Iran and Iranians outside of Iran, trying to dismiss the Iranians outside of Iran about people who don't care about you, people who are under the influence of, I don't know, Western um, propaganda, um, and that they're try they're just trying to push you to go and protest for their own self-interest. They don't actually care about your life. So in these rounds of protests, there seems to be actually, there's union across all these lines. So all of the tactics of dividing people against each other has failed. Like it seems like ethnicities are not fighting each other. Men and women are united. And even religious people and secular people are united. Um, upper class and lower class is united against the regime. And Iranians inside and outside of Iran are united. They don't hate each other. They're united. All, it seems like there's a unity against the regime, right? And that's what Sam, I think, is referring to. And like, oh, yeah, say today we are all one Iran. That's what. Yeah. We are all united. It doesn't matter where we are. We are all united together. We all we all have one voice. Like multiple thousands of people are here. Like I can't see at the end of the line. Like it basically goes forever. Like we are many, we are powerful. We are un we are unique. We are countless. Fear us. Fear us, Khamenei. The the child killing regime. A terrorist regime. Fear the anger of these people. Like we will see every single one of you in court, in in tribunals. Like this, this, uh, pe these people are not gonna let you go. Yeah, so that's it. So that's I a promise know that by some. Video was just like really powerful to me. Really, um, I don't know. It makes me emotional to see Psalm being so emotional. Like for weeks and weeks, he's lost his voice, like screaming for the rights of his nation that he had to leave behind. And nothing has stopped him like within the past month his mom died back in iran and he couldn't be with her because he can't return and so he has to mourn her you know he can't even be there to memorialize her and that hasn't stopped him and he fights so hard and to hear the way he was speaking in that video like it um i it just makes me think about all the people i know who their heart burns every day for what the people are going through back home and i have never seen people that are so tireless in fighting to raise awareness and be the voice of their fellow countrymen. Like, so tireless in fighting for the freedom and prosperity of their country. It, I know so many people that they are doing everything that they can think of to support the people back home because they feel powerless against 
you know, all the forces and they just have to sit at home and on Instagram, see people get shot every day. And I, I don't know, like just seeing firsthand people's whole being like burning for the sake of like the their liberties and the liberties of everyone that they had to leave behind it's i don't really have words for it <laughs> It's so deeply moving. <laughs> you know, I, um, some, he didn't get to go see his mother. I was, my, when my mom got cancer, I couldn't go see her, but she managed to come to Vancouver to see me, but he didn't get to go say goodbye to her mom. I can't imagine how that feels. And that's just made him fight harder. Like, I mean, he is so right to say fear us. Like, the tenacity, the tenacity of this community, this diaspora, like, is something I've never seen before. Yeah, and it's just hard to, like, one thing that is hard to imagine is that these people are giving up. Like, I think no, we have never, crossed. Never. There's something that has changed in the past month among Iranians that is impossible to undo. I think, like, we have opened a new chapter. And I just can't. It, and if it just stays like that, this, the regime, I, it's just, I can't imagine how it's just going to survive all this. I can't imagine mm -hmm. how it's going to survive this. Yeah, I don't know how long it's going to take because people make so many predictions about, I don't know, soon, soon, soon. I'm not going to make, I'm going to say soon, but I just, I just can't imagine it's lasting another two decades. It, I mean, if you it had a post on your Instagram, no, not Instagram on Facebook, like that yeah. you said in the last 24 hours, you said um, within the next two oh, decades, yeah. there will be direct flights between uh, Tehran and Tel Aviv. Yes, I'm yes. Like, hell yes. yeah! <laughs> yeah, I posted here. Right, this is what I posted. Wait, hold on. Yeah. I said in less yes, than twenty years, exactly. there will be direct. It will. There will be direct commercial flights between Tehran and Tel Aviv. I think so. I genuinely don't think so. I mean, I could be wrong, but like, I would be shocked if it's wrong. And over the past two years, you never and you never would say that things would happen this quickly. You would never say that. It I mean, would I'm getting this criticized fast. for saying less than twenty years. People are saying much earlier than that, but I mean, I, I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. you're just, just conservative, and when you make predictions, you used to say that this regime would outlast your lifetime. Yes. Yeah, but things have changed. Drastically. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Thanks. Yeah, so I just wanted to say, like, it's still very important to focus on the uprising that is happening in Iran. You're seeing it less in the news nowadays, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening and not continuing. And it's still as important as ever to continue to show our support because the internet restrictions are still ongoing. It is still very difficult to determine what has happened in different regions of Iran during these restrictions, like what's going on in Sanandaj, still very sketchy what's going on in baluchistan we still can't tell very easily and so i anticipate that we are going to be getting news about stuff that happened over the past 30 days only later and even though it might technically be a little bit expired in terms of the news cycle it's still so important to focus on these things because the regime is putting down these restrictions exactly to try to utilize that um yeah, AGA is saying we need to keep talking about it. 
Oh, and then we, I would be remiss if we didn't include uh, the super chat by our lovely Trails, who gave wait, us. Wait, 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 don't read, don't read, don't read. He wanted oh. us to show, he wanted us to have. <laughs> Give a good project. visual. He wanted a visual. Actually, let me show. Wait, hold on. Give me a second. Give me a second. He wants <laughs> he wants visuals with his quotes. <laughs> I like I need I need something in the background for this. Oh my um, god. Oh there we go. Okay. So let me just put this one. Okay. Bring it bring the quote. Bring the quote. Okay. We are now ready to read the super chat. Trells gave us a 100 Danish krona super chat. Thank you very much, Trells. It's saying a poem by Percy B. Shelley, quote, rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. Oh, wow. That's, that's very powerful. I like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Tro. Asked a question that said, "How do you feel about some Muslim channels bringing up Palestinian Uyghurs in response to Iran protests? Have you seen this? Like, no, I bring haven't. up um, Palestinian Uyghurs in what capacity in comparison to this? I think they're trying to save Islam because this sounds like the protest in Iran seems like a, because the main theme of it is taking off the hijab. So I think like they're trying to." There's the Iranian people are oppressed, and a lot of people are thinking Islam is responsible. So they're thinking like supporting Iranian victims is an anti-Islamic, is challenging Islam, uh, Islam's reputation around the world. And they're more so concerned they're about protecting Islam than human life. Yeah, I think if th that's a self-report, that's uh, Susanna. What you're saying is very accurate because <laughs> self-report. Yeah, because. Because that means that when you're defending Palestinians, because we defend Palestinians when they're um, oppressed or when Uyghurs, when they're oppressed, like we highlight them a lot here, right? But to me, when you when you bring that up in response to the Iranian protest, to me suggests that you don't actually care about Muslims. You care about the reputation of Islam and you're using as Muslim victims as a tool to make islam look better like you're kind of kind of like what other cults do like fallen the fathers um you know or christianity does like oh look at all the people that died for christianity right so in fact that suggests to me that the people who do that don't actually want palestinians to have better lives don't want actually Uyghur muslims to have better lives because they are a powerful tool they're a useful tool their victimization benefits the reputation of islam right you don't actually want them to have better lives because look at the way you're using it you're saying that the oppression of people who are being oppressed by an islamic regime is inconvenient to you so you bring up muslims being oppressed so these this is not about muslims having better lives for you this is about them existing so every time islam is being challenged you have your card to play this is your this is mm -hmm. your use your trump card this is so stupid sorgu is saying like i've seen some channels such as islam channel trying to say stuff like oh why don't you care as much about palestine as you as much as iran okay this is so stupid because i cannot tell you how many like leftist channels relentlessly cover palestine but very sparingly cover iran and actually promote essentially regime narratives by talking yeah. about how the protests are distorted by western media and that so, all calls for regime change are actually just western actors and, and the, not at all the will of the people which i think is actually racist um i actually i can't start talking about that i'll go on a vast <laughs> majority of leftist channels okay not all of them like some of them are what will bring up like when they're talking about iranians being oppressed by their own regime they have to spin it in a way that makes it the U.S.'s fault, and is like they take all agency away. fault. No, they like tell like wait, keep them talking, and then eventually they will talk about Mossadegh's coup. The you know, and again, that's a nonsense narrative. I could talk about that later. 
You should make a video um, about that. Yeah, we should make a video about that. How not how stupid that narrative is. That was not a coup. That was not a coup. That was completely legal. Okay, a coup was by definition has to be legal. What the Shah did by ousting Mossad there was completely legal. Just because he did it with the U.S.'s support, that doesn't mean that he ha- he wasn't within his constitutional rights to do that. So that's by definition not a coup. So, but every like vast majority of leftists, when they're like, "Oh, look at the Iranian people bringing up respect," oh, it's the U.S.'s fault. It's the U.S.'s fault. Everything has to be the U.S.'s fault. I think it's completely. Yeah. I think I've I've gotten to a place where I think it's literally racist because they are hell bent on ripping any authority from the Iranian people. Yeah. <laughs> Sinat is so right. He's saying U.S. exceptionalism at its finest. It's literally horseshoe theory. You are completely right. I was right. ranting with Rivka about this. Rivka and I are working on a special secret project for Atheist Republic, and um, it has now become my therapy session where I rant with her about the leftists I hate. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah, Dia saying it always comes back to the evil West. I was watching this, this video by some, you know, anti imperialist channel, and it's gotten me to a place where I'm starting to think that there's like some larger conspiracy at play because the narratives coming out of them are freaking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotten me like, there has to be something larger at, at play here. <laughs> like, it, it makes me so mad, I start to lose my mind. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, oh yeah, Trell is also saying Rizzo Aslan was uh, Rizzo Pahlavi. Rizzo Pahlavi. Oh, okay, was once asked about the coup, and he said that uh, what you just said, Armin. Oh yeah, but he did, he brilliantly used the question to argue for strong checks and balances in a free run. Interesting. Interesting. I should have. I should watch that. I should watch that. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we should move on. Wait, I want uh, to address a quick question. Gregory is saying, you go, red pill trad wife. Okay. I've been thinking about this. I think last week, me making jokes about being red pilled in a trad wife was like kind of irresponsible because like I'm I am increasingly frustrated and incredibly angry at a lot of leftist BS and progressives in general. But calling it red pilled and trad wifey whatever whatever i don't think is productive or useful because the rest of that ideology or whatever is packed with stuff that is toxic and actually not a reflection of my values i was just calling myself that because i'm so freaking frustrated with these like lefties who just call people who have different values in them or different opinions They're like oh you're red pilled you're a trad wife blah 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 and i'm like fine you're gonna freaking call me that like a cia plant you're a fed blah 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 yes i am yes i am <laughs> but what? we should i just want to clarify should... that it's not actually a reflection of like my values so, i just want a baby <laughs> yeah you okay so i think you understand some of the family values that are actually maybe we shouldn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater, like, and you think a lot of leftists are, like, giving up on so many things that are actually valuable, but you also don't want to go full-on right-leaning because there's actually a lot of toxic stuff there that you don't want to be associated with. So, and I think there's a lot of demand for this. Why don't we do a stream specifically on this topic, right? Doing red pill from the left, red pill on the right. (laughs) We do it right. We do it right. We don't do it like like the right, but like we do it right. You know, we do it not as <laughs> we do, we like because we have to offer something that is not as toxic as what the right leading community is giving us, but not as also loony as a lot of what's coming out of the left wing community. So I think like I think it would be great if we see we had a stream about your views on this something right in the middle i don't know what do you think oh my god i have a lot of views on this i was thinking about this last night i was writing a rant about how i think hookup culture is toxic we need yeah oh my god so much stuff um (laughs) so we're saying i'm pretty sure we all know susanna was joking but okay people are dumb as hell (laughs) 
And I experience it every day that I'm online. So I have to say that. But would you be interested in doing... People, there are a lot of people that don't like me on the left who legitimately say this about me and will use it against me. So I mainly have to use it. I have to say it because people will use that against me. But would you be interested in doing a stream or, and going over like some advice, some life recommendations and some guidelines that you think works best? Because I think like a lot of people would be interested in hearing what you have to say. And there's a sure. huge demand for this. Like right now, I mean, whenever I have are... the time, but to be fair, I think a lot of my opinions might be the result of my own biases and experiences. I know, I know, but it would be interesting to hear that. Yeah. About dating, about family, about relations, about gender roles, mm. about tr trans stuff. I think we could, I think we could do that very well. I think based on what we have been discussing and everything we've heard from both left and right leaning sources, I think we could go through all of them and then analyze them and see what actually makes the most sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Wait, are you, are you interested? Do you think, would you be interested in that? Like, tell yes, me. I'm going to, yes. I'm going to talk about how I think the left has completely devalued fatherhood. Devalued. Yep, there you go. But, That's the stream right there. Deval like how the left has devalued fatherhood. There you go. Fantastic. We should, we could like, oh yeah. I think it's actually like a central social ill in like my society. I'm not even kidding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's talk about that. All right, get my best-selling book, Why There Is No God, for free. Click on the link for it in the description.